Um, Every Place Has a Climate Story is a way of connecting climate change, cultural heritage, and place. And the idea for this really originated as a way of getting the National Park Service interpreters, helping them find a way to talk about climate change in the parks that they serve. There are currently 408 units of the U.S. National Park Service. Um, I'm just going to point out here, here's where Ann works, so yeah, all of our parks don't help her, even though we have quite a lot of territory up in Alaska. Uh, and we have more than 280 million visitors a year, and that makes it actually the largest informal education institution in the U.S. So we have a lot of contact uh, there. And we have a lot of people who look like this. These are our Park Service interpreters. They're the ones that wear the hats. And pretty much all of those 280 million visitors are very likely to interact with at least one of our interpretive rangers. Our rangers don't use scripts. They're actually trained in how to interpret and connect visitors with place. And so everything that they talk about comes from them, and they create their own presentations. And for several years, there have been some concerns coming from them about how they can talk about climate change. Most of them are not like this particular ranger. They, most of our parks do not have glaciers and none of them have polar bears. And so they've been really saying, I don't know how to talk about climate change here and to make a meaningful experience for the visitors. I am the lead for cultural heritage and climate change in the Park Service and I've been charged with building out an overall program for cultural heritage and climate change and I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. So writing the Every Place Has a Climate Story initiative was a way of bringing these two needs together. But recently, I've had an experience that adds even more gravitas to this situation than that. Now, I'm American, and at least for us, it's pretty difficult to make a policy or indeed an argument about anything without reducing it to economics. <laughs> uh, cultural resources really struggle with this. It doesn't fit well even in the natural resources concept of ecosystem services. There's heritage tourism, but that doesn't quite get at that ineffable quality of what is lost when cultural heritage is lost. However, um, the U.S. State Department is leading the U.S. participation in the current U.N. framework for climate change uh, negotiations that are leading up to the COP21 negotiations in Paris in December. And I had the chance to have a meeting with several of these colleagues uh, earlier this summer, pretty much with the kind of vague idea in my head that it would be useful for them to know what the National Park Service is working on, particularly what I'm working on. So I started telling them about my program and saying cultural resources are a thing, climate change is happening, we're working on this. And their eyes got bigger and bigger and they said, you're working on this? And I said, yes. And they said, apparently the small island developing states, uh, the small islands in the Pacific, that are there, they stand to lose everything and they are raising the issue of the loss of their heritage. And they're saying this is a non-economic issue but we want this recognized in the negotiations. This must be recognized. And they said, can you help? And I said, well, I don't have all the answers, but as Park Service is the lead federal agency for cultural heritage, we are working on tools. We may have things that we can help, and we have a broad network that we can pull together to try and make this better. <clears throat> so therefore, cultural, climate stories for cultural heritage are not just fun. They're not just nice to have. They're not just entertaining. The question from my State Department colleagues, I think, shows that being able to communicate well about heritage, to really share what's important, what's happening, and what we're doing about it, actually may even be a key point in getting our global negotiations for climate change moving forward. So no pressure. <laughs> um, right, so climate stories. I want to tell you a little bit about, and to put them in some context, for what the overall Park Service is doing for climate change. We have a program of about 22 people distributed across the service working on, directly on different aspects of climate change. I'm based in the Washington, D.C. office, and I'm the lead for cultural heritage and climate change, which is a synonym for being a program of one plus or minus some interns. Um, but it really is its a pretty robust pro program, and I'm quite lucky for that. Uh, we've established the basic program includes what we call four pillars of climate change response, including science, adaptation, mitigation, and communication. Very quickly, science is working with data, trends, and observations. Adaptation is figuring out what to do about what is indicated by those data observations and trends or decisions and planning. Mitigation is getting our overall climate change footprint down and then communication is sharing and enlarging, learning and engaging everyone within the Park Service and our public and across all of our partners with all of those different pillars and all of that information. Now the program I'm working on for cultural resources and climate change builds on this framework. Very briefly, we've set, I've set up a two-prong approach which addresses both impacts on cultural heritage and the capacity to learn from cultural heritage. 
By impacts, I have, I mean what I call the dread Asians, which is everything from inundation uh, to erosion to deterioration to destruction to conflagration, desiccation, invasion, and disruption. So all the bad stuff that can happen. Learning from cultural heritage is not news to any of us uh, who are archaeologists, but our director, Dr. Uh, John Jarvis, recently said this, one of the most precious values of the national parks is their ability to teach us about ourselves and how we relate to the natural world. This important role may prove invaluable in the near future as we strive to understand and adapt to a changing climate. So it is wonderful to be able to pull on that statement uh, and balance that with impacts. And we now have codified in National Park Service policy uh, this dual approach. Uh, National Park Service cultural resource management must keep in mind that one, cultural resources are primary sources of data regarding human interactions with environmental change, and two, changing climates affect the preservation and maintenance of cultural resources. And those two approaches are equal. So if you take those four pillars and you add this two-sided approach, you have a science for understanding impacts, and then you have a science of learning from cultural resources. And the distributed observing networks that Anne pointed out earlier pretty much fit in this column. We have adaptation of our management to the impacts from climate change, and then we have learning from cultural resources to understand how humans have adapted to climate variability through time. The division in mitigation and communication is a bit more meta, but the division still kind of works. There's incorporating the built uh, historic environment into our strategies to reduce our overall climate footprint, and then there is learning from our past techniques to find lower carbon and lower energy ways of doing things. On the communication side, there's the really practical approaches to addressing climate literacy and engaging, connecting all of our different partners across different levels, local, state, and national to international. And then there's the learning from, which is really creating the content and sharing that um, deep component of all that cultural heritage has to share for climate change. And climate stories actually fills in this last part of the pillar. And so I'm currently actually working on whole strategy documents that build out different parts of these components, I'm only going to be talking about that other little part, um, the communication learning from part today. So, right, so what are climate stories? Um, just make sure I'm in the right place. For the stories themselves, I've identified four major types. There is change in the material world, changes in experience and life ways, lessons in change from past societies, and the origins of the modern climate situation. By changing the material world, this really addresses the question of how do we see change happening in the world around us? This is climate change made tangible. Um, and my icon here is ice patch archaeology, where we're finding organic artifacts melting out of glaciers. But it can be everything from change we're seeing in bricks and, and landscapes to really changes um, that we can measure and see. Then there is the change in experience in life ways, and this is interacting with our traditional um, indigenous and affiliated communities, uh, everything that they are seeing and feeling uh, with the things that they have had to do. And my illustration here is some Native Hawaiians from Pua Hanua Ahononau in Hawaii, uh, who work with traditional fibers that are becoming scarcer. Uh, lessons in change from past societies really addresses the question of how did past societies respond to past environmental change. Uh, this is one we're probably most all familiar with, and my example here is Chaco Canyon and Mesa Verde, some of our sites in the American Southwest that were abandoned during the great droughts of, of circa AD 1300. And then you have the origins of modern climate change, and this really addresses the question of so how did we get here? Why do we have this modern climate change situation going on? And this brings together everything from um, social, cultural, technological, economic, philosophical, and intellectual trends that have combined together to create the present. And my example here is Harper's Ferry National Historic Park, which uh, was an early center of iron smelting and a lot of transportation in the coal <coughs> network. It really was one of our early industrial places. So how do you write a climate story? Um, well, they're called stories, but they really are not fiction. They actually are intended to be vehicles for best available sound science. They are intended to be used as is, and, or they, parts of them can actually be incorporated into other projects or other initiatives. And so therefore what I've decided to do with them is to actually kind of craft them, is to use a technique crafted by Randy Olson, who's a science communicator in the States, best known for his book, Don't Be Such a Scientist. 
And the method that he has created is called the and, but, therefore, or ABT method of storytelling. In his approach, he says, know what it is you want to say, and then organize the information so that as you say it, something happens. A story starts when something happens. It's not necessarily about an individual or about a plot, but it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and you get to it like this. And is where the story starts, but creates the tension, and therefore provides the resolution. And if you're a graphical person, he's uh, provided us with a sort of act one, act two, act three sort of organization. Randy also recommends a writing process that he calls the word sentence paragraph, or WSP method. The word really honors the overall concept of the ABT method. It's the theme of the story, what your story is about. The sentence concisely presents all the information uh, and point of the story, and it's usually phrased as an ABT. If I'm writing them, they tend to be very long, but it's all together in one sentence. And then the paragraph builds out the different components of the sentence. So, uh, what we've done for Every Place Has a Climate Story is our first major effort was this summer. I had an intern working with me in Washington, D.C., and we worked with five different parks that are illustrated in not very visible stars uh, right here. Uh, we, together with park staff, my intern, uh, Jacob Mace, did a lot of original research with the park, figuring out, finding their climate story. We identified themes and keywords, and then together we built out the individual sentences and then the longer paragraphs. Now, if you've been paying close attention, I have used three ABTs in this presentation so far, but it's going to make a lot more sense if I just share with you what we've already done. So, therefore, here are some. Uh, for Catoctin Mountain Park, we have a story type one about material change with the theme of continuity. Sentence is, the Catoctin cabins were built as summer retreats for the people of Washington, D.C. in the 1930s, including the president, and are still in use today but increasing temperatures will lead to damage from more intense rainfall. Therefore, MPS is researching ways to preserve the historic mortar of the cabins. Second one, uh, also a story type one about material change for Harpers Ferry National Historical Park with the theme of cycles. Sentence is historic armories such as Harpers Ferry used a lot of wood and such use led to extensive deforestation, which in turn contributed to extensive flooding. The forests are now regrown, but the industries spurred by these early factories are now linked to increases in intensity and rainfall. Therefore, the threat of flooding in this area continues. Moving out to the American Southwest, we have a story type three, Lessons from the Past, from Sunset Crater Volcano National Monument, with the theme of innovation. Our sentence is, Sunset Crater erupted in AD 1066 and covered an area already affected by drought with ash and made agriculture difficult to impossible for several years. But the local Sinawa population stayed in the area and developed the technique of cinder mulching, which helps retain soil moisture, therefore providing an example of traditional agriculture that may be useful in the future as the climate becomes hotter and drier. Moving to our Midwest, we have another story type three, uh, Lessons from the Past, from Hopewell Culture National Historical Park with the theme of resilience. Sentence, the Hopewell people returned to their lands after several centuries of extended flooding and experienced conflict and competition among themselves for resources, but they also developed a combination of new technology, architecture, agriculture, and new exchange patterns of gifts and alliances. Therefore, the resilience of their culture for the next 500 years can be seen as based both on new ways of doing things and new ways of relating to each other. And our fifth one is the story type four, Origins of Modern Climate Change. From the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal National Historical Park, we have the word, uh, the theme of choice, and our sentence is, industrial legends Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, and Harvey Firestone camped together along the Sino Canal in 1921 and noted to each other that if a hydropower dam had been built instead of the canal, it would have produced more energy, but the nature they themselves enjoyed camping in would have been very different if that had happened. Therefore, their enjoyment of the outdoors benefited from the choices of previous generations. I want to make a special point about the theme of this sentence and the finding of that theme as we're writing the climate stories. This particular situation where you had these industrial legends, I mean, Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, people who really kind of are at the root of so much of our modern industrial development, that they actually loved camping together in nature and actually started a trend of car camping that has actually influenced a lot of the shape of national parks to come. There is a lot of coincidence and sort of cycles uh, wrapped up in that. And 
Jacob and I came up with a couple of story approaches that we could only sort of describe with the word of serendipity. But when we worked with the interpreters at the park, they said, okay, that's fun, but that's hard to actually work with to create meaning for our guests. It's, it almost leads to a, a so what. That's interesting, but so what? So when we actually came up with this organization of information, we said, well, actually, it was a choice. Someone decided not to build a hydropower plant. They could have, but they didn't. And we said, it's a choice. And so these magnates were experiencing the choice from previous generations. They're like, oh, yeah, we can totally work with that, because that helps us talk with people about what choices we are making and where that's going to go in the future. When I first worked with Randy Olson on the stories, and he was telling us about the word, I was like, oh, do I really have to do that? I know what it is I want to say. Having worked with our interpreters and seeing how they related to the words and how they related that to a lot of themes they've already often set up for their parks, I'm now a convert. So this is actually a useful thing to get that in your head. There is one final piece of our projects um, having to do with Civil War battlefields and other sites of conflict. The National Park Service has 25 battlefield parks and 70 parks overall that are directly related in some fashion to the Civil War. Uh, and not only do they have really distinctive resources in them, but they really bring up the concept of audience and the issue of audience for climate stories. Very briefly, some researchers at George Mason University in Virginia have been working on perspectives of the American public about climate change for the past several years, and what they have come up with is that there is not just one American public with respect to climate change, there are actually six. And they call them the six Americas. And they range from the alarmed and concerned all the way down to the doubtful and dismissive. Additional research for the National Park Service has shown that different combinations of these audience tend to come to different parks. And in addition to that, visitors to the battlefield parks tend to be people who are extremely passionate about military history, and the reason they are at that park is to hear more about those particular battles and the people involved in them. They are not there to hear about the natural environment and particularly not to hear about climate change. So this raises the real challenge of if we want to talk about climate change in every place that we care for, how do we talk about climate change here? We didn't have the chance to work with a specific battlefield this summer, but we started to develop some guidance for how you might start to break that issue down. For example, with material change, uh, we developed the guidance to consider effects of flooding, erosion, oxidation, freeze-thaw stress, those dreadations on sites such as grave sites, monuments, buildings, forts, munitions, and earthworks. And we came up with a sample sentence, such as, the Burke family killed seven Civil War guerrillas during an attack on their farm and buried them on Big Island, but flooding and erosion are re-exposing the bodies therefore creating a new responsibility for us uh, for these and other impromptu graves. For the change in experience, uh, we came up with the guidance of to consider how the land has changed since the conflict, phenology of flowers for Memorial Days, and how change in weather have affected um, festivals or reenactments. And a sample sentence is, in northern New Hampshire, lilacs have traditionally bloomed around Memorial Day, and in some places, lilac festivals used to be on that holiday over Memorial Day weekend. But now lilacs are done blooming up to a week earlier, therefore there's been a break in that tradition. For types three and four, we didn't get to the point of actually being able to craft sentences, but we had the guidance of looking at the interaction between specific weather events and battles or campaigns, or considering how well suited equipment of the battle was for the environment in which it was used. And then for story type four, the origins type, what innovations were developed in wartime that have led to or contributed to modern non-military or civilian life. Final piece of uh, all of the stories that we created, they have been shared back with the parks along with all of the underlying information. And um, we've also managed to integrate our project with the National Park Service Climate Change Interpretation and Education Plan Toolkit. And what is happening is they have actually built a whole website with information on how to interpret climate change. Uh, Cultural Resources Climate Story has this a little bit farther down. Um, and all of the stories, including a map like what I have just shown you, and a how-to guide that we've written on how to write a climate story, will be <coughs> populating this website. This is the web link. It's currently being populated, um, and it should be live later this fall. There are many more directions I would like to go and lots of other things I can say, but I am now out of time. Therefore, I am going to end by thanking <laughs> a number of people who have helped make this possible. So big shout out to Tom for bringing this all together, including getting me here. 
Jacob Mace, my fearless uh, intern who helped do all the research, and the National Park Service, which is celebrating its 100th birthday next year. And that is my contact info. So thank you very much.